women have the vote, at least on paper. The amendment passes and it's ratified. It doesn't mean that black women, yay, we can vote. No, now you're under the same restrictions that black men were under after the Reconstruction period. It's an incomplete victory. Native Americans have to wait four more years to even be considered citizens. Chinese immigrants won't achieve full rights until the 1940s. People want to prohibit people from having free and unencumbered access because that means that power and resources will then be redistributed. And then who will that favor? And so there's this fear that's behind all of this. In the segregated South, an organized effort keeps black citizens from the ballot box. Residency requirements, poll taxes, literacy requirements. The very real threat of violence, of lynching, were visited upon communities who did try to exercise the right to vote, which was why there are vast communities where people didn't even attempt to try to vote. One woman brings the struggle to the national stage. Fannie Lou Hamer was born the last of 20 children to a family of Mississippi sharecroppers. Growing up in the Mississippi Delta, she thinks, well, voting could help change my economic circumstances, and so I am going to try and go and register to vote. She isn't allowed to register. Just for attempting it, she is fired from her job of 18 years and put out of her home. But she persists, becoming a voter and an activist. The bus that she's in gets stopped, and all of the people who are with her who are trying to register to vote, they are removed from the bus. Once again, women asking for their democratic rights are thrown in jail. Three white men came to my cell. One of these men was State Highway Patrol. He said, we're going to make you wish you was dead. She is physically assaulted to the point that that assault has lifelong effects on her. This time, there is no public outcry. President Johnson pays no attention. But Hamer does not back down. Instead, she launches a campaign for the U.S. Senate. Though the longest of long shots in a district where only 5% of African Americans are registered to vote, she uses the platform to raise her voice. We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. In 1964, Hamer speaks at the National Democratic Party convention in Atlantic City. We want to register to become first-class citizens. And if the freedom... She told the story of what was happening to black people in their quest for their natural-born right to, to vote. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to speak? with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America. She used her platform to tell a story that I don't think many people in the nation knew. She recognized that if the South was going to change, it was going to change at the hands of people like her. One year later, Congress passes a law to enforce the 19th and 15th Amendments, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. As much as we want the story of voting rights, not just for women, but for everyone in the United States, to be a forward trajectory, there are always new barriers that people find ways to put up. December 1919. Two months have passed since Wilson's stroke and turmoil racks the White House. In the Senate, support for Wilson's beloved peace treaty continues to plummet. The First Lady struggles to keep a lid on his medical condition until Wilson can get stronger. The rumor mill was indeed that Edith was running things. And hers, a woman, government by petticoat. You know, what could be worse? I love the phrase, petticoat government. 
It's such a primal fear that women will somehow surreptitiously come in and take governing away from the men. For two months, Wilson has been sequestered in his bedroom, largely protected from prying eyes by Edith Grayson and Ike Hoover. Finally, Edith allows two legislators, Senators Albert Fall and Gilbert Hitchcock, in to see the president. It's an incredible story because Senator Fall and Wilson, they were adversaries. Today, it just would never have worked. This bedroom in the Wilson's mansion is laid out exactly like his bedroom in the White House. Wilson biographer John Milton Cooper describes to collection manager Asanta Waboachewa what he believes took place. So some senators cooked up an excuse to go see him. Well, Grayson and, and Mrs. Wilson were ready for that, so they did a setup. They had it so that the bed covers covered his left side, which was the paralyzed side, but his right hand, he could use his right hand. Edith hides Wilson's paralyzed left side under a blanket and places papers on the nightstand to the right of the bed. Papers would have been here that he could reach. Oops, no, I shouldn't have done that. But so that he could could reach out and pick them up and look at them as as if, as if he'd been reading, them, which which he had. Gesturing with his right hand, Wilson manages to carry on a conversation about brewing troubles in Mexico. Both Edith and Dr. Grayson kept careful notes of what was said. When a senator asked her what she was doing, she replied, I thought it wise to record this interview so there may be no misunderstanding or misstatements made about it. A power play or merely a steward performing secretarial duties? And it worked very well <laughs> because both Paul and the other senator came out and said, the president's fine, he's no problem there. Wilson had perked up a good bit. He rose to the occasion, too. Besides concealing her husband's condition, what else might Edith have been doing behind closed doors? A backlash is brewing in the post-Civil War South. Black men were running for office and winning office. It was a time where black folks really believed a change was going to come. But racist reprisals soon follow, as states devise new ways to prevent black men from voting. There were practices in place in the South, like, you know, the grandfather clause, poll taxes, literacy tests. As Jim Crow laws institutionalize racism, black women take action to help their communities. At first, they were just these local, small groups of black women thinking, I want to impact and change my community for the better. So many of these little clubs develop, they form the National Association of Colored Women, which allows them to petition for the rights of black women on a national level. Its motto is, lifting as we climb. As we lift, as we go higher, we bring our community with us. Perhaps the most famous club woman is Ida B. Wells. I mean, she was a fierce, courageous woman. In 1884, more than 70 years before Rosa Parks refuses to give up her bus seat, Wells sues a railroad for discrimination and wins. After the murder of a good friend, she takes on what is likely the single most dangerous issue of the time, lynching. Nobody was going to tell Ida B. Wells no when she had a mission. Like Sojourner Truth before her, Wells understands the power of image. 
Black womanhood was an important part to that in terms of really debunking all of the sort of racist and sexist tropes that had followed uh, black women from enslavement um, onward. These ideas of black women being loose and lascivious and unclean. Well's portrait is a great example of how African-American women across the board were using photography as a kind of a statement about their own autonomy, their own power. The perfect hair held in place with a comb, the brooch, the lace bodice embroidered with beadwork, all of it contributes to the image she wants to project. To the 19th century eye, they would see an African-American woman who was educated, who was dignified, who was using the perfect put-together outfit to make a statement about how she was an empowered woman. The end. Eleanor Roosevelt has been in the White House for more than eight years when America enters World War II. She's established herself as an independent-minded and politically engaged First Lady. With FDR disabled by polio, she's become his eyes and ears, pushing forward social programs. And now she throws herself into the war effort. In October 1942, Eleanor travels to Britain, becoming the first First Lady to make a major trip abroad without her husband. It's a perilous undertaking. Britain is being bombed by the Germans. Ignoring the weather and the proximity of enemy aircraft, Mrs. Roosevelt travels on to an ATS training center to learn more. On a tour of Canterbury in the south of England, the dangers soon become apparent. Within a matter of hours of her leaving, 50 German fighter bombers came over in the dusk, sowing death and destruction again among the homes of Canterbury. In London, she sees the devastation of Nazi air raids. Eleanor's visit does much to cement the relationship between Britain and America. Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, cables FDR saying, Mrs. Roosevelt has been winning golden opinions here for her unfailing interest in everything we are doing. The following year, Eleanor travels to the Pacific to meet American troops fighting the Japanese. In Guadalcanal, a place of particularly brutal fighting, she meets soldiers preparing to go into battle. Touring hospitals, she tends the wounded. As First Lady, she represents the human, caring face of the presidency. Her care for the soldiers and their families runs deep. She reviews the standard letter sent to the families of servicemen killed in action, redrafting it with a more humane tone. She's driven by a great sense of duty and of the debt owed to these troops. During her Pacific trip alone, she meets an astonishing 400,000 servicemen. They are to Eleanor the sons of the nation. Every man who fights for us is in some way our man. His parents may be of any race or religion, but if that man dies, he dies side by side with all of his buddies. All the men are our men, part of our United States, which they have saved so that we can still call it the land of the free and the home of the brave. 100 days after Emmett Till's murder, 42-year-old Rosa Parks is riding in the black section of a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, when a white man boards. All the white seats are taken. The driver demanded that I give this seat up for a white man. I didn't feel that I was being treated as a human being. I refused to give up this seat. I said no, and I wouldn't give it up. Park says later, I thought of Emmett Till. I just couldn't move. 
She is arrested, found guilty of violating segregation laws, and fined $10. Her defiant action inspires black people to protest segregation on the buses by refusing to ride them. Many blacks in Montgomery walk miles to work each day. Images of empty buses and peaceful protesters on national TV recruit many to the cause of equal rights. The bus boycott continues for more than a year. The Montgomery bus lines face bankruptcy. The leaders of the protest also take their battle to the courts. On November 13, 1956, the U.S. Supreme Court rules that segregation on Alabama buses is unconstitutional. My fellow Americans, I am about to sign into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Lady Bird was fighting for the Civil Rights Act. She and Zephyr Wright, their African-American cook, would drive from Texas to Washington when LBJ was in Congress. Many hotels were segregated, and she refused to stay at those hotels. And Lady Bird was instrumental in, in making him see the human side of racism in the South. The Civil Rights Act outlaws discrimination based on color, race, and religion. It's passed in the face of fierce opposition. With an election approaching, an exhausted Johnson tells advisors he might not run. Lady Bird steps in, penning a nine-page memo explaining why he must. She admired him, she loved him, she believed in him. And so whenever he had weakness or self-doubt, she helped him to overcome that. Johnson will run in 1964 with Lady Bird right by his side. In the campaign that follows, she'll show extraordinary personal courage, even risking her life to get her husband re-elected. They had just passed the Civil Rights Bill and a lot of Southerners felt that it had been shoved down their throats and they were, you were changing the culture, you were changing the way they had grown up, and uh, they were very hurt. She believes that it's time for the South to change, but she treasures um, what she believes is the core and the culture and the goodness of the South. So she decides to make a trip. On October 6th, Lady Bird boards a steam train heading south. It's the first time any First Lady has made a campaign trip like this without her husband. She defies death threats and her husband's advisors to take her message to the people. She was really fearless because there were bomb threats and they even had the Secret Service have to go clear the tracks before she went out. Over the next four days, the Lady Bird Special travels through eight southern states. During most of the trip, Mrs. Johnson was booed by people in the crowds who didn't like the civil rights law. There were people heckling her, shouting, Blackbird, go home. Uh, just a moment, please. Just a moment. People would scream and not let her speak. And I would be, you know, I'd get angry and want to defend her. And, and Mother would just be very calm, and she would say, <laughs> My friends, this is a country of many viewpoints, and I respect your right to express your own. Now it's my turn to express mine. Thank you. By the time the train reaches New Orleans, Lady Bird has traveled 1,600 miles and addressed more than 200,000 people. Many southern states are lost, but LBJ wins the 64 election by a landslide. Christian just graduated from high school. National Museum of African American History and Culture senior curator William Pretzer is about to take him back in time to a contentious and risky moment in American history. Have you ever heard of the Little Rock Nine? I know that they were brave students who 
got into their high school when a lot of people weren't for desegregation. Absolutely. Those nine kids who volunteered to be the first to desegregate the high school were subject to a lot of violence and a lot of hatred, and their families were threatened as well. So it took a lot of courage on their part. The youngest one was Carlotta Walls, and this is the dress that she wore that first day of school. Millions of visitors have learned about Carlotta's story in the museum, but few have had the chance to meet her. It's an incredible honor to meet you, Carlotta. It's a pleasure to meet you. And there's one object in particular she'd like to share. There's a Little Rock Nine high school diploma sitting right in front of me. <laughs> That's the most important document out of the collection that I have presented to Smithsonian. It really means a lot to me. And for me to receive that diploma, it validated all of the things that I had gone through. Despite having the law behind them, when the Little Rock Nine tried to go to school, they were met by huge, angry mobs. There were 17 Little Rock policemen, and they could not hold back the mob that was there. We were spirited out of the school because the mob was asking to lynch one of us, and not asking, yelling it. That was probably my scariest day. Did you ever think it would get any worse than the mob and the hate that was being spewed at you daily? I thought that was bad enough until yeah. February 9th, 1960, when my home was bombed. When that took place, it took a lot out of me because they were on my property now and had, had planted a bomb. It was late at night. We didn't know what had happened. Glass was everywhere. I jumped out of bed and my mother was coming out of her bedroom, my two sisters as well, then ran towards the front of the house. Did everybody make it out okay? Yes, fortunately we weren't harmed. Did it ever cross your mind as even an option to quit or to drop out? I knew that that's what they wanted me to do. I didn't have to go to back to school. I could have taken a day off. I went back to school that next day because I was determined not to let them win. Yeah. I felt like I needed to also send a message that I'm still here, that I am going to continue, despite what you're doing to me. Carlotta's strength and determination finally paid off. In May 1960, she graduated from Central High School. What was going through your mind when you finally grabbed the piece of paper? that I had completed what I started. And that was very important to me. It validated everything that I had gone through. I was able to complete my mission, which was to finish high school at Little Rock Central High. The situation's unprecedented, the president unelected, but Betty Ford will emerge as one of the most fearless and outspoken first ladies ever. I think she was one of the most honest people who's ever held the job. I think she just learned that one lesson all first ladies should know is be yourself. And she was thoroughly herself. Jerry had promised her that he was going to retire. And then all of a sudden, boom. But less than two months into her husband's presidency comes a defining moment. A routine health check turns Betty's life upside down and puts women's health at the top of the news agenda. I can remember it as clear today as the day it happened when she sat me down and she said, I have breast cancer. Betty has to have a radical mastectomy. She makes the unprecedented decision to go public about her illness and its treatment. You didn't say breast on TV. You barely said cancer on TV. So to put the two together and then to have the first lady say it was, you know, earth shattering earthquake news. As Betty recuperates, more than 50,000 letters flood into the White House, many from fellow cancer sufferers. The first lady turns a personal tragedy into a public service. Have you been here before? women decided they better check themselves out. And they did, and too many found that they had a problem. 
I think Betty Ford loved being First Lady. I think it was really her calling. And she had all this potential that she wasn't able to unleash as a housewife. And here she was given this megaphone. I do not believe that being First Lady should prevent me from expressing my ideas. <laughs> Betty takes up the cause of women's rights, but her vocal support for the Equal Rights Amendment alarms her husband's advisors. The West Wing was not happy with somebody who was trying to make something of the role of the First Lady. They really want her pouring tea. They don't want her making waves. In August 1975, the First Lady appears on CBS's 60 Minutes, where her liberal social views cause a sensation. Two legalize abortion and bring it out of the backwoods and put it in the hospitals where it belonged, I thought it was a great, great decision. She comes out and talks about being pro-choice and talks about how her children had probably smoked pot and that she would smoke pot if she was a teenager, things that are incredible to hear a first lady say. You've also talked about young people living together before they're married. Well, they are, aren't they? <laughs> she hadn't had the rough edges worn smooth. She wasn't a political creation. She was a woman, she was a wife and a mother, and she was very honest. And, and that is why people loved her so much. In the fall of 1969, Hillary enters Yale Law School. There she meets a fellow student and Rhodes Scholar, William Jefferson Clinton. Hillary and Bill are soon inseparable. It's clear he's destined for a future in politics, but some rate Hillary's political potential more highly. They marry in 1975. Hillary is 27, Bill 29. They settle in Bill's home state of Arkansas. Hillary becomes a successful lawyer in the Rose Law Firm in Little Rock. Bill, meanwhile, is building his political career and in 1978, he runs for governor. She takes a leading role in reforming education and health, notching up successes, but also making enemies, a pattern repeated in years to come. After five terms as governor of Arkansas, Bill decides it's time for a run at the presidency. One controversial selling point? Buy one, get one free. As election day gets closer in the presidential campaign, a realization is dawning on Hillary's Republican opponents. She was a serious, serious person that had a future in politics, maybe beyond First Lady. Early on, they recognized that they had to try to knock her down. President-elect Bill Clinton. Despite all the scrutiny and criticism, Bill Clinton wins the presidency. The country really does get two for the price of one, as Hillary gets an office in the West Wing of the White House, an unprecedented event. In September 1995, Hillary uses that platform to make one of the most important speeches of her career at the United Nations Conference on Women in Beijing. China's record on human rights makes the First Lady's visit highly contentious. There's a huge controversy now, in this country and everywhere, over whether she should go. On the flight to Beijing, Hillary's team is still working on her speech. I actually took the final copy up to her uh, in her cabin, and everybody on the plane was asleep, and it's always the poor speechwriter that's still awake trying to do stuff. And she said, I just want to push the envelope as far as I can on women's rights and human rights. I believe it is time to break the silence. If there is one message that echoes forth from this conference, let it be that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights once and for all.